we'll get started. We'll get started right now. Um, thank you ever so much for, for joining us for this webinar today. We're so pleased here at the IOM uh, to be working with the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance and to have an opportunity to present to you all uh, some new guidance that has been jointly prepared on promoting ethical recruitment in the hotel and tourism industry. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Philip Hunter. I serve as a labor migration specialist and the head of the labor migration unit at IOM's headquarters uh, in Geneva. IOM is the UN migration agency for those of you who, who don't know the organization I'm representing today. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you again um, for, for joining us. Um, you will hear a little bit from me as the, as the hour goes on, but hopefully as little as possible will shine as much of the spotlight on our speakers and representatives um, from the industry and from the, the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance in particular. Um, let me simply say at the outset that um, this work has been uh, now, uh, I would say, uh, two years in the making. Uh, it comes in under a project that is generously supported by the U.S. Department of State's Bureau for Population, Refugees and Migration, uh, PRM, as we call it. Um, we're so very, very pleased to have the support of the U.S. Department of State and taking our work forward with the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance and its members. Um, I'm going to run through very briefly uh, the agenda. Um, if we can move to the next slide and then we'll move into the, the presentations. So you'll be hearing first uh, from my colleague, Sarah McGregor, um, who is a project officer at IOM and the lead on the project with uh, the Alliance. Uh, and she will focus on migrant workers in the hospitality industry in general. Uh, we will then also hear from the Alliance and from uh, Hema Varma in particular, who's the head of human rights at, at the Alliance. We'll then move on to presentations from Marriott International and the Radisson Hotel Group. Uh, at that moment, I will introduce our speakers um, more fully, uh, and then we'll move into the Q&A and, and wrap up. Uh, we'll have some time for questions, and I encourage all of you that are with us today uh, to use the Q&A function to please raise your questions. Um, that is the, the most efficient way to get, to get the questions to us and we'll make sure to pass them on. I will personally make sure to pass them on then uh, to the speakers. Let's try to make this interactive. Um, we, we're now two years into a pandemic and, and I hope all comfortable with Zoom uh, and other virtual platforms. So please do feel free to use the, the Q&A function to raise the questions that you have for our colleagues. With that, I think our introductory remarks are done and let me pass the floor to Sarah. Uh, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Philip, for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to share a little bit more about migration um, and ethical recruitment and the work that we do, as well as the importance of this work um, to the hospitality industry. It should be noted that uh, more people are actually migrating now than ever before in history. Um, current estimates are that one in seven or one billion people are currently on the move. Now it's important to note um, that migration has been impacted by COVID-19, but rest assured people are still moving around the world for a variety of re reasons. One of the major reasons why people move and migrate overseas is for employment. As members of the industry and those interested in learning about how hospitality is impacted by migration, it's very likely um, to note that for employers that migrant workers are likely in your supply chains. In 2017, uh, the ILO, IOM and Walk Free released their latest global estimates on modern slavery. While these estimates, which you can see here on the screen are conservative in nature, it's shocking to see that around 40 million people worldwide are victims of modern slavery. Of these, around 25 million people are victims of forced labor, with the majority linked to global supply chains. Of these, around half of the victims are trapped due to debt. And this is very important to note uh, when addressing these issues. And many of the migrant workers, um, uh, many of the victims are migrant workers. 
Now, one of the biggest challenges um, in the area of international labor and labor migration um, is the current international recruitment system. It is extremely fragmented and oftentimes the laws and regulations that govern um, international recruitment can vary wildly between or, um, or even within countries. In fact, many countries fail to properly regulate their recruitment industry at all. This leads to confusion, confusion and a lack of transparency about what is involved in the recruitment process and what is and isn't permitted. This is further complicated by the fact that there are lots of steps and stakeholders involved in the recruitment process. This includes labor recruiters, employment agencies, sub agents, but also can include medical and training institutions, government officials, travel companies, and so on. Many of these stakeholders perform their roles with little oversight and accountability. Another challenge within the prevalent international recruitment system is that it operates largely on the assumption that migrant workers are responsible for covering the cost of their recruitment and migration. This has created a situation where migrant workers are seen as a source of revenue for unscrupulous recruiters and has led to job orders being sold down the labor supply chain. For employers, it's important to note that hiring decisions are now often influenced by who can pay and the cost of recruitment and migration rather than who is suitable for the job on offer. Overall, the international recruitment system is highly vulnerable to corruption and unethical practices. It's a low risk and high reward system for exploiters with migrant workers ultimately paying the price and it doesn't serve the interests of responsible businesses who are committed to addressing human rights risks within their operations and supply chain. So what can go wrong for workers? Well, you'll see some terms here on the screen and some of the situations that migrant workers can often find themselves in. Sometimes when workers are forced to pay for their jobs, their passports are taken away as collateral to stop them from leaving until their debt is paid off. Similarly, sometimes workers are misled about their job on offer. For example, a worker might believe that they have a job working as a hotel receptionist only to find on arrival that they're working as a gardener and are working to perform manual labor. This job might be unsuitable for the worker and they unfortunately would not be able to leave due to the debt due to their migration costs. When all or even just some of these factors combine, it creates a situation where workers are essentially trapped in their jobs and can be considered victims of modern slavery. And it's important to note that all of this can occur without the employer's knowledge, and this puts you at risk. Within the industry itself, migrant workers can be vulnerable to exploitation in the hospitality industry for a range of reasons, including the seasonal nature of the hospitality sector, high and low demands for labor over varying tourism seasons that lead many migrant workers to being employed on sh short term and insecure contracts. The nature of low skill and low paid work limits migrant workers bargaining power with employers. Complicated outsourcing and employer relationships where migrant workers may be employed to work at a hotel but have no formal employment relationship with the hotel can also complicate the recruitment process. Migrant workers may have language or cultural barriers that prevent them from speaking out when exploitation occurs, coupled with lack of understanding and awareness of their legal rights and protections. Visas can also tie migrant workers to specific employers in some countries. This not only limits migrant workers freedom to leave exploitative employment situations, but also their capacity to report abuse for fear of deportation. Similarly, migrant workers who hold irregular migration status, such as a lacking a necessary visa, are more vulnerable as they are less likely to report abuse for fear of deportation. The lack of effective grievance mechanisms in relation to recruitment and the employment of migrant workers can also put them at risk. It is particularly difficult for migrant workers to access remedy when they have returned to their countries of origin. Gaps and inconsistencies between countries' policies and laws governing labor migration can also reduce transparency and allow unethical recruitment practices to flourish. For companies, there are several risks. Being associated with these, um, with exploitative practices, 
um, and allegations of modern slavery can damage a company's reputation. It can also impact an entire industry. It can lead to government fines, prosecution, or civil proceedings against a company. This not only costs money, but can divert staff away from their everyday jobs so that they can manage the situation, either in court or with the PR teams. With so much pressure on companies to demonstrate what they are doing to combat modern slavery, many big brands and companies have developed policies and codes of conduct which set out expectations for their suppliers and how they should conduct their business and treat their workers. A supplier who is linked to modern slavery could be breaching their client's code of conduct and could face repercussions, including possibly losing their contract. The issue of skills mismatches, poor retention of workers, and health and safety issues also needs to be linked back to how workers are recruited. Under the current recruitment model, workers are selected for their ability to pay rather than what they are bringing to the table, like their skills and their interests in particular employers. If a worker doesn't have the right skills, they may not enjoy their job or they may have been deceived about their employment and they are less committed and less productive in the workplace, not to mention in a situation where they may feel trapped. Similarly, workplace accidents are more likely to occur, which can lead to stoppages in production when the inappropriate staff are hired for positions. All of this can be linked back to recruitment. So what is ethical recruitment? How do we counter these issues? Well, IOM and the Alliance have worked very closely together over the last couple of years to develop resources, which my colleague Hema will go into a little bit more. But all of this is based on a simple definition that ethical recruitment should be fair and transparent. It should comply with the law. It should respect to the rights of migrant workers and it should follow the employer pays principle. Now, to go a little bit more in depth, our guidance and the work that we do together and the work that we have engaged the industry on is based on the IRIS standard firstly, which is an international standard or tool which can be applied to any jurisdiction and is designed primarily to make the recruitment industry more professional, transparent, and ethical. The standard was developed over several years with a wide range of stakeholders from government, civil society, and the private sector and is based on international human rights instruments the general principles and operational guidelines for fair recruitment from the International Labor Organization, many conventions and standards also from the International Labor Organization, and the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, as well as taking insight from many codes of conduct and best practices from the, the recruitment industry. As you see here on the screen, there are several, seven principles um, under the IRIS standard, and we're not going to go in depth into these today, but if you are interested, we can share the IRIS standard with you in the chat. But each of these principles is reflected in the guidance and the work that we do and provide support to, to you on. It is really the core of how we engage on ethical recruitment and how we encourage the private sector to engage on ethical recruitment. This also aligns quite well with the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance's principles on forced labor, which stipulate that every worker should have freedom of movement, no worker should pay for a job, and no worker should be indebted or coerced to work. These principles have been committed to by members of the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance and were generated by the industry for the industry to promote ethical recruitment. Together, using the principles on forced labor and the IRIS standard, we're here to help you to take steps to improve ethical recruitment. Now I'm going to turn this, the time over to my colleague and who my main collaborator, uh, Hema Barma, the head of human rights of the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm just going to get my presentation up for everybody to see. Right, so in this section, so thank you, first of all, um, to Sarah for this really comprehensive overview. I think um, for, for those of us who already work on this issue, it's, it, it, it's never, um, it, it's always um, good to be reminded of the facts um, that we're dealing with, and they can seem to be very big and, and complex and overwhelming. So the next steps that I'm going to take you through are the practical tips for getting started 
what can you as a business or um, as an individual hotel do to um, start working on this on, on, on this issue and to make sure um, your business um, is working to embed ethical recruitment principles? So first of all, making a commitment. I think this is a really important first step. It, it will help you um, to get buy-in from your senior leadership um, to actually make the changes that will be necessary and along that journey. It will help you also think through what the process means ahead of taking the first step. And it also um, helps to commit your, uh, to, to communicate your commitment and that will um, establish accountability uh, for everyone. So it will help you basically also create a clear plan where you um, look forward to see, okay, here's where I'm starting and this is where I'm gonna want to get to. Again, I want to refer you to the um, published guidance notes uh, that we have developed together with the wonderful team from IOM because there are some very real and practical examples there for you to that will help you on that journey and also help you um, identify what you should be including in your commitment. The next step really is to take stock. Where are you um, when it comes to ethical recruitment? Um, means to take stock of your existing practices, identify gaps. Um, does your hotel or brand, for example, already have a policy around ethical recruitment? If not, this might be the moment to start one. Um, if you already have a policy, check that it aligns with the IRIS principles uh, that Sarah's just mentioned um, and identify any gaps that you see in there. Um, it's also uh, important to keep all your stakeholders engaged during this process. So identify them and get them to buy into, into, your, um, in, into this commitment. And that might need an awareness campaign. You need to educate the various stakeholders on what ethical recruitment means. So you might need to uh, conduct um, a series of trainings to help uh, your stakeholders understand what this um, pro uh, process will entail. Um, if you already have a policy, uh, also you might want to think about how is it enacted? Is it, um, uh, are there any differences in various parts of the world? Will you be needing to adjust it to account for local uh, legislations and differences? Next up is implementing change. So once you have established where your action points are, start implementing the recommended chains, changes. You might choose to do this with just a handful of pilot properties or um, in a specific location or region, just to work uh, the process through once and then speak to your, uh, engage your stakeholders and, and see where are, what, what worked well, where are your barriers, how do you need to change and adjust the process to make it work for everybody before you start implementing it um, across your organization. Solicit feedback from all your stakeholders during this process. I think it's really important to keep all the, the people involved um, engaged, and this will help you fully understand where they are experiencing challenges and will ensure that you will uh, be able to mitigate them before they become bigger challenges or you try and roll and, and repeat those mistakes in, or issues in other regions. So once you have um, all these processes in place, and I know I've mentioned stakeholder engagement already, but this is a really important and key um, part of this whole uh, process is to making sure that everybody who is impacted by um, your um, ethical recruitment um, policies and practices gets a chance to, to contribute to it. So this might um, also include um, establishing or activating your grievance and complaints mechanisms, um, checking that the, the mechanisms you have in place are um, fit for purpose, are actually doing what they're meant to do, giving a platform to some people who may otherwise feel reluctant to share their experiences or their thoughts with you um, to give them a voice. Again, I want to refer you to, to, to the guidance because there's really um, a lot of information information in there on how to tackle this. Um, at the same time, you'll need to be prepared to address any issues, big or small, that are being uncovered uh, uh, throughout this process, because, you know, a, a, a big element here is also establishing trust in, 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 in the integrity of the work that you want to do. So again, the guidance will provide you a lot of food for thought here. 
then reporting the outcomes, collecting feedback um, data and, and throughout this process, collecting it and analyzing it towards uh, at this stage uh, to learn from it, but also to use it to report. Transparency is always it is a key word here. Uh, again, it will it goes back to the commitment that you've made that you make at the beginning. Um, reporting progress will actually demonstrate that you, you are um, uh, living up to the commitment that you have made. Um, for some of the um, larger um, companies out there with different jurisdictions. Again, this might be, um, it might help you um, analyze nuances that are um, important, that coming up locally and address those. Last but not least, monitor your progress continually. So I think the idea here is, is that once you have gone through this whole process one time, it's not a one-off event. It's not job done and you can move on to the next one. I think it's really important that the, the principles that you are aligning uh, your business practices with, just like recruitment is a perpetual um, business function, ethical recruitment should become part of business as usual by going through this process. So I, I really hope that um, with the points that I've just mentioned, I, I have been able to break it down a little bit for you and make it um, make it make it real. And um, with that, I also want to hand it back to Philip because we're going to hear from some of our members um, who will uh, give us a little bit more insights about um, this topic within their own organization. Thank you. Thanks, Emma, uh, and thanks for quite a quite a comprehensive overview of, of what's provided in, in the guidance, as well as some very practical, clear recommendations. Some of the, the keynotes that I picked up as you were speaking, uh, the importance of, of reporting and transparency, the importance of grievance mechanisms and making sure they're tailored and, and fit for purpose for this particular category of, of, of workers in a supply chains context or an operational context where we know there are specific vulnerabilities that are not necessarily faced by others. Of course, the adoption of policies or the revision and updating of policies, data collection and monitoring, absolutely vital, but often not getting enough attention, I think, in this context. And then of course, stakeholder uh, relationship building and engagement, uh, not only in policy development, but across um, various aspects of implementation. Thank you so very much. I think combined with Sarah's presentation of the various challenges and risks for those of you, um, having that together gives you a very good sense of what you'll find in the guidance, um, both the presentation of the risks as well as uh, the guidance on, on solving some of the challenges that companies face in their own operations and supply chains. So with that, I'm very pleased to to go one level deeper and begin to, to hear from colleagues, uh, the, the members of the Alliance who have lots of experience, a depth of experience and knowledge to share at this time related to their own practices and the circumstances that they um, are facing and the steps that they've been taken, taking in recent years. I'm going to pass the floor first uh, to Miss Abby Horswell, who is the Senior Manager of Human Rights and Social Impact at Marriott International. Abby, I understand that you also have a few slides that you're going to share with us. Thank you so much for being here with us today and the floor is yours. Thanks, Philip, and hi, everyone. Good morning from rainy Washington, DC. I'm just gonna go ahead and pull up my slides here. Um, so hopefully you can all see them. And forgive me as I uh, find a way to, to start the presentation here. Abby, you can usually click the little button at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. All right, hey, thanks for, for the pro tip there. Of course, everything went seamlessly while we practice this morning, but when it comes time for, for the real presentation, um, technology is always a challenge. So again, my name is Abby Horswell and I manage our human rights initiatives at Marriott International. Um, hopefully the, the name and some of our brands are familiar to you, but just to level set, Marriott is a worldwide operator, franchiser, 
and licensor of hotel, residential, and timeshare properties. So what that means is that we typically manage or franchise our hotels rather than own them outright. Um, so to give you an idea of our, our footprint, I've included some of our year-end 2021 statistics on this slide here. But I want to focus in particular on our labor force, since that is what is most relevant to the topic of unethical recruitment that we're here to discuss today. Um, so at year end 2021, we directly employed 120,000 associates at properties, customer care centers, and in above property operations, and 97,000 of those were here in the U.S. We also managed an additional 205,000 associates. So what that means is those team members are employed by the hotel companies, but their employment is managed by Marriott. And then we have a third category of hotel personnel that are employed by our franchisees or other management companies that are hired by our franchisees. And while we certainly encourage them to implement responsible and ethical practices for human capital management, ultimately franchisees and management companies are responsible for establishing their own labor and employment practices. So all that is to say that we ultimately have a very decentralized labor model, which can make it increasingly difficult to implement and uphold ethical recruitment practices. But hopefully in the next few minutes, I'm going to share some ideas with you to, to give you a sense of how you can implement some policies and programs, even with this type of business model. So if you've talked to anyone at Marriott, you've probably heard them whip out this quote from Mr. Marriott that how we do business is as important as the business that we do. So with that longstanding commitment to ethical and responsible business practices, we have a number of policies in place. Um, and I've highlighted the ones on this slide here that really govern our approach to human rights and ethical recruitment. They're also linked, so you can go ahead and, and click them and access the policies and see them for yourselves. Um, and what I'm going to do is really just focus on the aspects of them that touch on ethical recruitment in broader human rights issues. Um, so within our human rights policy in 2017, we enhanced it to specifically address unethical recruitment and establish a strict no fees recruitment policy and explicitly state that the company does not ask for money or fees as part of the application process. Within our principles of responsible business, we also have a set of human rights principles that establish the foundation for managing our business around the world in accordance with all applicable laws and our own high standards of ethics, integrity, and corporate citizenship. Our business conduct guide emphasis, emphasizes Marriott's support for human rights and instructs associates to report any concerns if they suspect that their property is being used in any way that doesn't respect or uphold human rights, um, which of course includes any issues of unethical recruitment. It also provides instructions for reporting these concerns through a variety of grievance mechanisms, including anonymous reporting channels, and it emphasizes our strict no retaliation policy. So if an associate raises any concern in good faith, no action will be taken against them as a result. And then finally, our supplier conduct guidelines um, really set forth the guidelines and standards for our third party labor suppliers um, and other vendors and suppliers. Um, in 2019, we also updated that document to include um, a variety of human rights criteria, so specifically expectations that suppliers prevent unethical recruitment, child labor, forced labor, human trafficking, and respect an employee's freedom of movement and not retain any of their employee identity or immigration documents. They also explicitly state that we expect suppliers to not charge recruitment fees as part of the application process or use any fraudulent recruitment practices. So while we don't have a standalone policy on ethical recruitment, I think each of these policies really helps us respect migrant worker rights. 
promote ethical recruitment principles and establish those commitments that you heard Hema talk a little bit about earlier um, so that we have sort of a, a playbook to work from and a commitment that we've established. So the policies that we have are really in large part implemented through our sustainability and social impact platform, which we call Serve 360, doing good in every direction. Serve 360 helps us align with and support targets for relevant UN sustainable development goals and other global indicators. Um, and it helps us establish focus areas where we can execute the most compelling initiatives and drive positive outcomes that align with our business, um, including those on human rights and ethical recruitment. The platform is guided by four priority areas, or as we like to call them, coordinates, nurture our world, empower through opportunity, sustain responsible operations, and welcome all and advance human rights. Obviously, the ethical recruitment piece fits firmly into this hot pink coordinate that we have here, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a minute. Um, the other piece of our Serve 360 platform that I wanted to highlight is that we do publish an annual report every year that highlights the initiatives that we've undertaken and really reviews the progress against some of those longer term goals that we've established and discusses opportunities for continuous improvement because we know that these issues require constant attention and that we can always be looking for new opportunities to enhance our efforts. Again, that report is publicly available so you can find it on our website or by Googling Serve 360 report. So in the interest of time, because um, I know I only have a, a few minute, more minutes to, to talk with you here today, I just wanted to kind of quick, quickly show you this timeline of our human rights efforts, um, which I really hope gives you an idea of the types of initiatives that can be implemented to uphold human rights and embed this type of commitment into your company culture. Even if some of these initiatives aren't necessarily specific to ethical recruitment, I think they do still provide an opportunity to really establish and underscore those commitments and again, embed them into to your culture and, and reflect your company values. So again, some of the ideas here start at the highest levels with policies and nonprofit partnerships, um, but we also have things like training and resources that we've developed to really reinforce those policies and commitments. And in our last couple of minutes here, I want to talk to you about a couple of case studies that really show what this looks like in practice. Um, so I've clipped kind of the, the news articles that spurred the allegations. And in both of these cases, they were raised from the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Um, so first, in June 2021, we received an allegation that a recruitment agency based in Nepal was charging fees to workers for jobs in UAE, and Marriott was listed among their clients. Um, of course, we immediately investigated and found that one property had used the agency to hire three associates, and the director of human resources there interviewed them and determined that two of them, in fact, had been charged recruitment fees between 450 and 600 US dollars. Those fees were for a Dubai-based orientation that was not required or even requested, um, as well as for a ticket fee, um, which is something that the hotel um, always covers for newly hired associates. Um, so because this was a direct violation of our no fees recruitment policy and a violation of the terms of the contract with the agency, we immediately canceled the contract, which was regionally based, and notified all of our human resources associates and other above property stakeholders that, that might be engaging with recruitment agencies to refrain from using this particular agency in the future. Similarly, um, we had another case in May 2021 where it was alleged that a security firm in Qatar was giving workers contracts that restricted their abilities to change jobs and required them to work for this particular firm for five years, which was, of course, a violation of local labor law. The allegation said that a Marriott property uh, had used the firm. 
But at the, the time of the inquiry, we found that the property did not have a contract with the firm and did not have any supplemental security personnel that was provided by them. While this case didn't directly impact us, um, we did recognize that there is a lot of interest around Qatar as the host of the upcoming World Cup. And with the rapid growth of the travel and tourism sector that that really has spurred. Um, we know that there have been other reports about poor working conditions, low wages, restrictions on freedom of movement and poor living conditions. And you know, while this is the, the current focus that has grabbed a lot of attention, we also recognize that ethical recruitment is a global issue. And we really have identified a need to institute more robust ethical recruitment policies and programs than we already have. So as we look ahead, um, we know that these risks of unethical recruitment require really constant attention. Um, and we want to make sure that we're sort of advancing our training and resources to meet whatever that new focus area might be um, and the evolving needs that, that we're seeing among our migrant workers. So we're looking into some potential short and long-term opportunities like enhancing our approach to due diligence on suppliers, particularly recruitment agencies and third-party labor suppliers, implementing a more proactive system of auditing suppliers, again, with a particular focus on those labor suppliers, um, expanding and enhancing our existing ethical recruitment policies, um, launching an ethical recruitment training for some of our key internal stakeholders um, that really focuses on human rights risks and working with migrant workers. Um, reissuing and amplifying our guidance on recruitment scams is sort of a tangential issue to the topic of ethical recruitment. And then finally, reviewing our associate housing standards. Um, again, looking for those areas of opportunity to really enhance the work that we're already doing in this space. Um, so with that, um, I want to thank you for, for your time this morning, afternoon or evening, whatever the case may be. Um, and I certainly hope that, that this brief overview gave you a few ideas of what this could look like in practice and what some of the policies and programs that you might be able to implement. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Philip. Thanks, Abby. Uh, brief, but very comprehensive and, and greatly appreciated um, to, to take some of the, the thoughts and comments that uh, that Hema um, presented to us and then to drill down with the, the practical experience and steps that that you have taken yourselves. Uh, I'm particularly intrigued by, by some of the, the, the language you've introduced about continuous improvement um, and, and constant attention, which is such an interesting way to approach these. It, it reflects implicitly and explicitly how important it is to have that comprehensive and really robust, dedicated engagement that you've uh, just described for us. So thank you so much for presenting. Um, I'm sure the, the colleagues who are with us today have learned a great deal from those, uh, not least also the case studies to really give a sense, not only of the challenges, direct challenges you faced yourselves, but then the, the steps that you've taken to address those. Thanks again. Um, we have one more speaker for us here today, uh, Mr. Sven Wiltink for um, uh, the Director of Responsible Business for Europe, Middle East and Africa uh, from the Radisson Hotel Group. Um, Sven, I'm going to pass the floor in the interest of time immediately to you, um, and then we'll open up for questions thereafter. Thank you again for joining us. Excellent. Thank you very much, Philip. And also thank you very much, Abby, for, uh, for the detailed presentation of Marriott. <clears throat> Although we are uh, perhaps seen as competitors, uh, this is really a platform where we're able to, to have pre-competitive pre pre discussions. So it's really good to, to see this as well. I try not to uh, repeat whatever uh, Abby already highlighted, what we're doing as an industry, uh, but there will be some similarities between what Marriott is doing and what we are doing as, as Redis Natal Group. Um, so my name is Sven Wiltink, Director of Responsible Business for the Redis Hotel Group. And one of the, um, the key focus areas within my role is the, the lead on the Human Rights Program. Um, also, we're active member of the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance, and together we drive the, the human rights agenda, which is also including the, the development of the ethical recruitment and the wider hospitality industry. 
apologies if you hear my daughter on the background. She really wanted to join, but had to close the door, unfortunately. Uh, Sarah, would you mind going to the next slide? So just a, a short overview of our, uh, our footprint. So we have currently 1,600 hotels in operations and development uh, in around 120 countries and territories with nine distinctive brands. Um, and with that, we have 100,000, approximately 100,000 team members uh, within the group. Uh, so quite a, a large portfolio to cover. If you see in the next slide, um, these team members, they, they covered 137 nationalities, um, but more importantly, um, and that's something we're actually focusing on as well, what are the risks in our supply chain? Uh, it's highlighted here that 13% of our workforce is actually outsourced labor. So that means that they don't have a direct contract with, with the hotel or property, but with, um, with another agent. Uh, of this, 95% of the team members have a full-time or part-time contract and the remainder, they have either a zero hour uh, contract where, where there's no hours guaranteed. Um, so that is the assessment we've done at the end of last year. Uh, so on the next slide, you see that um, our focus area is think people and that that's really to, to drive the business ethics and not only for our team members, but also for our guests, for our owners. And this is part of the, the wider responsible business program, which dates back to, since 2001. And that functions under three pillars, the community, planet, and then people. So under this pillar, we really focus on our guests, our team members, and people in the wider value chain. So that's really important to highlight that it's not just anyone to our doors, but also working with our suppliers there. Um, so, our commitment, um, sorry if we can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, our commitment is, is very clear. So we wanna tackle forced and bonded labor in our operation and the supply chain. And we do this with um, five key principles. And this is something we launched back in 2016, um, really focusing on the development of existing uh, policies were, which were already in place. But in the end, we strive that no employee has a um, sorry, that every employee has a work contract, that no employee is forced to work, that no employee is forced to hand over any government issued documents, such as passports, visas, work permits, etc., to third parties or to the hotel. Uh, no employee is required to pay any fees in exchange for work, and there's no deductive uh, deductions made from, from any wages. So this is also reflecting the, the IOM IRA standards, is reflecting the, um, the principles of forced labor from the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance. And it's really the expectations which is applied for, for our practices to working towards labor agencies, but also the, the outsourced labor suppliers, which, which the hotels are utilizing. Um, and then this is not just standing on itself, this is really linked to um, and addressed in the supplier code of conduct. Uh, it's embedded in supplier contracts. Uh, we're actually focusing on, on the education of our team members on these kind of issues um, and encouraging stakeholders in the broader business industry to, uh, to make a stand against slavery and human trafficking. I will get to that uh, a little bit more detail in a minute as well. Um, so on the next slide, you see the uh, governments and, and policy setting uh, we have put in place, and I won't talk you through everything here, but I think it's a few things we need to highlight. It's, you need an, uh, a strong foundation uh, in terms of your governance structure, and therefore you need buy-in from your key stakeholders. And who are your key stakeholders? Starting with leadership. Uh, so that's, of course, from a, from a corporate point of view, your, your executive leadership, but from a hotel point of view, that's your general manager and the owner. It's really important that you have the stakeholder buy-in there. Uh, from a corporate level, we will obviously follow a policy with our area teams, specifically in uh, the HR area and, and procurement, uh, but also further down to hotel management and a specific general manager, uh, the HR team, uh, but beyond that as well, the supplier base. So that the supplier is very clear what are the expectations. Um, beyond that, of course, the alignment within the industry framework and the principles such as the, the uh, Sustainable Hospitality Alliance principles of forced labor are key to this as well, because it's one thing to commit to it, 
of course, the further steps are to, to embed it in your practices and ensure that it really becomes alive, but also stays alive, as Emma rightly put. It, it's something which needs to um, continuously being, being focused on, and it's not something which take the box exercise one off and then it's done. You, it's a continuous process. Um, so these global frameworks, they, they give a minimum requirement to drive the, the ethical business practices, um, but surely we shouldn't stop there. So in the next slide, you actually see our uh, responsible recruitment toolkit. And, and this is uh, something we've, we, we're still growing. We we're still learning in, in this space, uh, but we have established um, toolkits providing the support to hotels, wherever they are, um, really to, to drive responsible recruitment, but also to make it tangible, to understand why is that needed? What, why is it important? Uh, who is affected by it? What are the risks? What are the, um, uh, the steps taken? What kind of due diligence do I need to do? Uh, but also, if I find the case, what, what are the next steps then? So that framework, that, that uh, toolkit, uh, such has been put in place in 2017, rolled out uh, to get the, uh, the buy-in internally uh, with all, all our hotels in, uh, in all the different areas we operate. Um, but from there, it is an ongoing process. So just a few, few elements I wanna highlight here. Um, so the, the toolkit includes hotel team guidance so that a general manager or HR team knows uh, what they can communicate towards their teams, what the team can expect as well from, from, their, uh, from their hotel management. Um, it includes a self-assessment questionnaire. So a hotel is able to use the questionnaire to actually see um, are there potential risks for the migrant workers. But also, and, and this, I cannot highlight this enough, worker interviews are so important. It's very easily said, yeah, we put a an, an structure in place, this comes from corporate level, we just do the tick the box exercise. But to get that feedback from your workers, that's so vital. And are they honest upon arrival when, when they may have paid a recruitment fee? Um, and, and they just arrived in, in a new country, in a new employer? Probably not. So therefore, it's also important that if you do work or interviews, you don't only do that at the very start, but also when a person feels more comfortable to speak up. So the process for us is arrival, but also after six months and a year uh, to do follow-up interviews to really understand um, if the business ethics, which, which we expect to run at the hotel level are done as well. And that, that's also part of constant communication. So with that, we're looking at uh, back of house material. I'd be highlighted that as well. It's something really relevant for, for any of the workers to understand, okay, this is what, this is the group I'm working for. This is expected from me, uh, but also understanding um, how to, to flag an issue. Uh, so have the, the appropriate briefings mechanisms in place. And of course, it's it's way how you can do that internally, um, HR at the hotel level. But of course, there's also corporate ethics and whistleblower um, lines available. But that's normally not um, the the initial approach a worker would take. Um, therefore, it's also really important that uh, work committees are available for the worker. And as a group, we expect every hotel to have an independent chosen worker committee uh, representing each of the departments, but also giving the workers an additional voice towards ethical recruitment. And this is not only, only ethical recruitment, this goes beyond that. Uh, yeah, the last point here, um, and that's something which we actually uh, embedded in our processes after a project we've done with the IOM, is uh, the remediation protocols. Because it's, it's really important that a hotel not only does the due diligence with, with the recruitment agents, but also looking beyond that. And then what if they find something? Uh, what is the appropriate action to take? So with that um, remuneration protocols within the toolkit, provide guidance to certain risks which are identified or which could be identified, as you say, um, and from there to, uh, to take next steps as well. Um, then I've got my, uh, my last slide, and that's actually a case study, which um, uh, probably similar as what, what Abby presented as well. Um, it was in uh, June, uh, June of last year. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, last year. 
which was a news message at that time from the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Um, and that was because our Redison logo, not even our Redison group logo, uh, was used on a recruiter website in Nepal. Uh, so from there, um, we've obviously done a, a de decent and, and full detailed investigation in, in the claim which was made. Um, and what we've learned is that uh, one hotel in the UAE, in, in Dubai, um, actually um, hired 11 interns, and that was just at the end of uh, 2019. And what the hotel learned is that these 11 interns, which started working in uh, January 2020, uh, for a period of 12 months, uh, they've actually paid uh, recruitment fees. That was the headline, but it wasn't... Uh, necessarily recruitment fees, but what the, the um, interns actually explained is that they paid an onboarding charge to the recruiter, which was 780 uh, dirham prior to the actual recruitment process, which should never have been allowed by, by the university they were on. Um, but because it was common practice uh, at the university, it's obviously not something they, they affect. Only during the, the pandemic, and then, of course, we have a significant drop in, uh, in business volume. Uh, the borders closed, and that actually uh, meant for the interns that uh, they were not able to, to travel home. Uh, of course, the hotels kept them safe, made sure that um, whatever could have been done to provide it with, um, uh, with support who was given. And then you need to think of um, uh, credit for uh, calling home or phone credits. Uh, but of course, accommodation, food, and shelter shelf was, was all provided. Um, at the end, uh, with, with doing this investigation, the reimbursement was, of course, done as well for, for the interns uh, who, who paid this recruitment fee. But I think it's, it's more important, from uh, certainly from my point of view, is what, what is happening with that? What, what are the, the, the steps we should have taken? Um, what, what's, what went wrong, but also how can we correct this for future practices? And in, in terms of the hiring policy, interns are being seen as a different uh, group level. Um, and this comprehensive feedback we've actually received also from the hotels. Um, and that was all the hotels in the Middle East, because uh, we've done this work working session in support with, uh, with the IOM. Um, we made several updates um, to, to actually um, ensure that the, the policy on, on recruiting of interns uh, was very clear. So clear communication to the recruitment agents, but also the, the extra due diligence uh, done before, um, before departure with the interns. And I think the, the last thing I want to say, um, and that, that's highlighted in, in a report from the IOM, but also ILO, it's, it's really about how long is the journey or how short can you make the journey? So to, to eliminate as many different stakeholders and to be able to, to hire directly um, and to be in contact directly with the worker, that is vital. And that's just not always possible. So it's really key for, for our hotel teams, for anyone who's recruiting, uh, to consider how can I make that, that uh, communication lines as short as possible so that the actual person start working with us, knows what to expect, knows they get a contract, knows they shouldn't pay, uh, any recruitment fees, no, the passport should not be taken by anyone, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, um, it, it's a journey um, and we have started it and we, we learn from our mistakes. And I think the industry is doing that, but altogether we're actually promoting responsible recruitment. And that is a message which is, uh, it, it needs to be given in the industry, but also beyond that, because it's, we, we certainly should not be the only ones doing this. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sven, for another uh, very thought provoking and comprehensive um, set of experiences and, and steps that you've taken. And let me again, as with the other presentations, so complimentary, call out a few concepts, uh, ideas that you've just set out. Uh, I mean, obviously, due diligence runs through quite a number of what colleagues have said. So important to have that focus and, and gratefully appreciate also your focus on the worker interview steps, something that is absolutely vital um, and very, very interesting to hear that you do it in a phased approach where not only upon arrival, but then also with follow-up interviews at the six 
six and 12 months mark, I think is, is really something very interesting for other colleagues and, and other companies to, to explore. And then of course, the concept of remedy is a very, very big and important one in the business and human rights space. So understanding what steps look like in terms of uh, promoting that access to remedy is, is likewise so vital. Colleagues, thank you all so much. Um, we've had such a rich uh, presentation of, of, of the, the issues as well as more importantly, some of the steps having been taken. We only have two minutes and I know there's also uh, meant to be a very final slide just in terms of wrap up, but we have a number of questions that have come in. I'm going to focus just on one and open the floor. Um, and then we'll, I think we'll wrap up and let people get on with their days. That question is what are some of the biggest opportunities and challenges that you see for the future of this work going forward. Um, Sarah, I don't know if we maybe proceed with, with maybe 30 seconds each. I'll, I'll pass the floor first to you, Sarah, then Hema, then Abby and, and Sven, in case you want to reflect on opportunities and challenges or perhaps just opportunities as you like. Uh, I, can, I can start. Um, Thank you, Philip. So I'll go very quickly. Um, you know, thinking of opportunities and challenges, um, I think that one of the the thing that came to my mind first is that there's just so much to do, <laughs> and that can apply to both opportunities and challenges. It can be really overwhelming to see how many things need to be done or how how far you can go, but that's also a huge opportunity. It's quite exciting actually to look at something as you know the path ahead of you and to have the steps and to have the principles. And so, you know, hopefully all of you can enjoy the guidance, um, whether you're watching now live with us or you watch the recording, um, but you can utilize our guidance and of course, resources from the Alliance and IOM and our partnership together to start doing something. And that's the best thing that I can encourage you to do because it is the best opportunity right now is to take action and to, to get started. Because once you get started, then things start to fall into line. It gets easier and easier the more you go ahead. So I'll pass it on uh, to, I, I believe Hema's next. Yeah, thank you. Um, very briefly, so um, I will say the biggest opportunity and from alliances, from the alliances standpoint, the biggest opportunity for us is to take all the learnings and the input from the members and from the experts at IOM and create a lasting um, legacy of resources that will be available to the entire industry. I think that this is this is the power of 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 this collaborative approach, that um, the 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 tools, the trainings, the guidance we develop, we develop develop them in partnership with the experts on migration and the experts of running hotel and tourism businesses across the world and create um, resources that 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 work. So I, I want to call out the that we will be uh, probably in, in, in the second quarter of the year we'll, we'll be able um, to post um, a, a lot of the tra additional training that will kind of highlight the various points in the guidance. We will be um, posting this training online and make it available for anyone who actually wants to take their first step onto, onto the journey of embedding embed uh, ethical recruitment practices. We'll make that available to them. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Maybe very, very briefly back over to Abby. Thank you. Sure. So I think one of the challenges for Marriott in particular and, and perhaps other hotel companies as well is that we are very large, very global companies. So even armed with the great resources that Hema mentioned and some of the many areas of opportunity that Sarah highlighted, it can feel very daunting to do things like enact new policy and establish company-wide training and practices. So I think an area of opportunity that we're really leaning into is balancing some of those longer term goals that we know will take some time and energy to implement with some of those short term goals, those things that can still be quick wins for us where we are kind of making that slower and, and incremental progress as we work towards some of those um, larger scale and longer term changes that we hope to make. Thanks, Abby. And uh, Sven, the last word uh, to you, challenges and opportunities, or one or the other, as you like. I'll, I'll go for opportunities. And, and I think I want to thank as well IOM, the Alliance, in this uh, perspective, because it's, it's all about public-private partnerships. 
and to move the needle to increase the work the private sector can do, uh, but also working together with civil uh, society with, and with governments. It's, it's kind of the triangle. Um, and, and the further we can go, the more partners we get involved, uh, the more we can develop this. And I think uh, the work we've done together um, that, that you can't do that alone as a private business. So it is really important um, that, that public private partnerships are, are happening and also evolving. Thanks, Sven. And thanks also for raising uh, the, the comment about as, as an intergovernmental organization, IOM, it's always very pleasing to hear um, also the reference to, to partnerships and cooperation with governmental bodies. So, so vital for our own work. And certainly within IOM, we see uh, a very important role for us to play in bringing those various stakeholders together alongside civil society. All right, colleagues, we're at uh, 4.03 in Geneva time, so three minutes past the hour. We did start three minutes late, um, so I'll, I'll uh, beg for your forgiveness to, to add another 30 seconds on just to give you a clarification of what the next steps are. Please accept my apologies to those who, who raised questions we weren't able to get to. We had quite a number that we simply didn't have time for, but I would encourage you, of course, to be in touch with both the Alliance and IOM at any time, should you wish to follow up with us directly, please feel free to download and distribute um, the, the links to the guidance document itself. Please come back to us with any comments or questions you have about that. Um, we, as, as Hema indicated, uh, we do have uh, training resources that are available currently for in-person virtual type trainings, but also those that will come online in the very near future. Of course, feel free to uh, have a look at the websites for more information about both of the organizations. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, on the very final slide, there may even be a QR code for those of you who are tech savvy and would like to use that QR code to um, give us some feedback on, on the webinar, um, please feel free to do so. Unless there's anything else from our speakers, from our partners, I think we'll wrap up there. Thank you ever so much to the speakers, to the Alliance. Um, it's been a pleasure having you. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you all for participating today. And uh, I wish you good bye, good luck wherever you are and stay healthy. <laughs>